Let's go back to the beginning for a second because we're going to build on these fundamentals. Think back to uh, think back to sine inverse, just regular sine inverse. Okay, we really need to know the regular sine inverse, cos inverse, tan inverse graphs fundamentally if we want to then progress to what happens when we modify them, squeeze and stretch and shift them in different ways. Okay, so I want to know this really well. So I wonder if you can remember with me what does sine inverse look like, what is its range, and what is its domain. Okay, so I will help you or give you a bit of a nudge in the right direction by first starting off with the graph. Okay. So here is my best shot at a nice, you know, one line through sine inverse graph. A couple of things to remind you of. Remember how the regular sine graph and cos and tan, the regular sine graph has stationary points here and here, right? So I take it back, tan obviously doesn't. If sine has stationary points, that means that at those stationary points, the tangents would be at a stationary point, the tangent would be horizontal. Do you agree? But these are the inverse trig functions, so the tangents will not be horizontal anymore. They will be vertical. So you know you have the shape right if you can place your ruler or pen right beside here and you're like, yep, thumbs up, looks like a tangent. Okay? Some of the graphs that I've seen around, you're starting to get a little bit, um, a little flimsy over there. It looks like you're not going to have a tangent there. Please be watchful for it. Okay? Now, we've got zero here. How do you remember that sine inverse is the one that goes up and cos inverse is the one that goes down. There's lots of ways to remember this. I mean, you just draw lots and lots of them and hopefully that will get it into your head. Uh, but you draw sine inverse and then the next second you draw cos inverse. And if you're like me, I got very confused between the two of them. So I want you to want to remind you of something which you may or may not have looked at earlier, which is before you looked at inverse trig functions, just generally speaking, we thought about inverse functions, right? Say for example, e to the x and its inverse which is its inverse which is log x, right? Like so. Or we thought about functions like, say, uh, this part of x squared, that restricted domain, and its inverse, which is the square root of x. Okay? Now, I want to call back some of the language that we developed way back at the beginning of calculus. Okay? Both of these functions are what we call, throw some language at you, okay? We, these are both monotonically increasing, okay? What that means is, um, what, what happens when someone is monotone? It means they are talking in the same way all the time. Their voice never goes up and never goes down. That's what monotone means, right? Monotonically increasing means it's always going up. If the x never turns around, x squared in this domain never turns around, okay? So it's always going up. Can you see what that means if you look at the original function? The original function. What does that mean about its inverse? Well, look at log x. Look at the square root of x. Do you see that if your original function is increasing monotonically, then your inverse is also increasing? Do you see that? You see how, yep, I'm going up. I'm slowing down, but I'm still going up. And this guy's also going up. Okay. Which part of sine, because we don't do the whole thing, which part of sine do we convert into the inverse? What's the domain? It's from negative pi on 2 to pi on 2. Think about what the sine graph is doing. I'm just going to hijack this. Think about what the sine graph is doing in that particular domain. From negative pi on 2 to pi on 2. It's, um, it's increasing, isn't it? And so it stands to reason that its inverse will also be increasing. Make sense? And the reverse is also true. What about cos? Which part of the domain do we take to turn into cos inverse? Where do we start? We start at 0, and then we go all the way to pi. And in that domain, cos is decreasing. You see that? It's gone down. Which is why its inverse is, not that guy, its inverse is decreasing. Is that OK? All right, now, I need you to help me with the numbers here. You can use the graph to help you, right? Uh, and we already sort of answered this question. What is the wrong color? What is the range of this sine inverse graph? How low, how high? Negative pi on 2. Do I include the boundary? Yes, I do. That's why I have filled circles. Um, y, and then it goes all the way up to pi on 2. Fantastic. What about the domain? This is even easier. Negative 1 all the way to 1. Are you okay with that? All right, now we need to get those facts imprinted onto our brains because they will then help us when we get to this, okay? 
If this is what we want to graph, and not just the regular version, okay, what we're going to do is algebraically we're just going to shuffle things around so that we can see the range and the domain. This might seem a little backwards to you, but I promise it will make sense by the end why I do it this way. Okay. Firstly, see this three and this two, right? I'll start with the two first. Does this alter the shape horizontally or vertically? It's a stretch or a scale. Which way is it? It's horizontal. How can you tell that it's horizontal? It's attached to the x, which is the horizontal axis. Yes? What about the 3? That changes, you, that changes the range. It changes it vertically. To make that a little bit clearer, I'm going to put the 3 where it really belongs, which is with the vertical variable. Is that OK? So I'm going to write it like this. Is that okay? Now, you see how I got range and domain out of the y and the x? Well, this is sine inverse, just like that is. So I can get the range and the domain out of these guys, right? But the difference is, I don't have y between negative pi on 2 and pi on 2. I've got y on 3. That's what exists between negative pi on 2 and pi on 2, okay? And in the same way, I don't have x between negative 1 and 1, I've got 2x. So that's what I'm going to write, like so. Okay. So the real range and the real domain are simply y and x on their own. So you can see in this case, all I have to do to the whole inequality, what do I do? I'm just going to multiply by 3, and that gives you uh, negative 3 pi on 2 all the way to 3 pi on 2. What about this one? What will I do? Divide by 2. Bingo. Okay, now many of you are going to say, I already knew that that's what it was going to be. I can draw this now. In fact, I'm going to hijack this graph over here. That's how cheap I am. And I'm going to say it's exactly the same, except it just won't go as far, right? Or it will go further. So range is from negative 3 pi on 2 to 3 pi on 2. The shape is preserved. And from here to here, what are those boundaries going to be? What does the domain tell me? Negative a half. To a half, okay, and you're done. Now, many of you will say, I could have drawn that without thinking about the domain and range in this strange way. Let me give you two reasons why I'm going to encourage you to do this anyway. Number one, frequently you will get asked for the domain and range anyway. Like you have to provide an explicit answer to that. It's like part one of the question, okay? That happens a lot, so you might as well get good at calculating it. Secondly, Sometimes this is really the only way to make sure you don't get your, um, yourself in a twist, literally, because the domain and range aren't nearly so obvious.